further ado, let's get started. Kasper, over to you. All right, thank you so much, Maria. It's great to see so many of you again. Many familiar faces actually here. Uh, Willie Vidable, um, one name I recognize. So great uh, to have you here today again. Um, platform engineering, you know, is really a hot topic these days. It wasn't a hot topic uh, to be transparent when I started talking about this. Um, I've done this now for uh, quite a while. So it's great to see so many of you here. Um, we want to make this um, a learning opportunity for all of us. Um, that means if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to put them into, into the QA. Make sure to address panelists and hosts so everybody can see them. Um, but if, even if you don't, we will uh, try to cover them. And we will, you know, Maria will monitor the questions if it makes sense in the flow then please go ahead. This is not about specific products. Uh, this is not about advertising for products. This is really about platform engineering uh, and the, the different dimensions. And in particular, we want to speak about how to approach platform engineering. Um, and I want to, it's very important for me in these things to go beyond the buzzwords and really try to give you some tangible recommendation how you can approach this. I can dive very deep. So if you have specific questions, don't shy away um, from, from asking them. I always enjoy that. I, I have, you know, dedicated, um, you know, large parts of my life to platform engineering, really. Uh, we are running uh, the some of the communities. Um, we help structure, that's an open uh, project. Everybody can send pull requests, internal developer platform.org, platformengineering.org, the platform engineering slacks, the meetup groups, uh, platform con, the conference for platforming. There are more things like newsletters and there are a couple of very exciting things also coming up. And I'm also the CEO and founder of Humanitech. Um, and I encourage you to reach out to me if you have questions around platform engineering or just want to chat. You can reach me at kasper at humanitech.com or at my very humble Casper official uh, Twitter uh, <laughs> handle. Um, that was just because all of the other handles were taken. But I'm very all, you know, on Slack uh, and I'm always um, happy to chat. Not enough of you do that. Please make sure that if you have questions, you hit me up. So, um, all right, today I'm going to talk about platforming. I want to set a layer play, lay, uh, level playing field here. What that actually is, how do I think about platforms at the moment? They are, I think I can make that a lot more specific than the, you know, a lot of the blurriness that's currently in the market. Um, and then I want to give you a step-by-step -step guide to nailing your platforming journey. Um, I have seen many, many, many platform journeys in the last years. I'm seeing, I would say personally, maybe two, 300 setups every year um, in, the, in the work that I'm doing. And I see where people struggle. And my goal is to try to, I mean, th the struggles are always more or less the same. The fallacies, I wrote, wrote a larger piece on the fallacies in platform engineering that might be an interesting read. We are going to send that afterwards, but I'm, I actually want to look at how can you think about this and strategically approach the start point. I think the start of this uh, is something that many people get wrong. All right. Um, let's actually start with the problem. What's the underlying problem that we try to solve in platform engineering? Why is this suddenly coming up? And I hear some voices screaming, oh, this is just another term. And, you know, we were fine with SREs and DevOps, but that is actually, you know, that's not actually taking the situation we're in serious enough. Um, DevOps is about a cultural way of approaching team constellations, if you want, and inter-team communication. SRE is uh, basically taken from the Google worlds and SRE badges and uptime and reliability. But there, there is a, an evolution that happened between 2010 and to where we are today. And that evolution means that 
the world has gotten a lot more complex. The, the software industry, um, cloud native is some is actually something very complex and it's becoming more and more complex with the day. The Twilio CEO has uh, written a good book that I recommend, uh, Ask Your Developers is the um, title. And in that book, he makes the statement, and I like that the systems that we are operating today are it's so much larger scale. We're, we're, we're serving hundreds and thousands of users. Those users have very high expectations on availability, quality, UI, UX. We constantly need to, um, to respond to the demand of the market. And at the same time, the granularity of the solutions has increased. So if you compare your app, average application to your applications at, in 2010, they're 25 times more complex. You need five times more specialized tools in your tool chain. And uh, we have that global scale, global demand. And, um, you know, we're still, it's, you know, we're, go we're going crazy. We're in a crisis, basically, a crisis um, of the economy. And we still miss half a million engineering jobs um, in the United States alone. So that's actually the problem uh, and why there is uh, a place for, um, platform engineering. And that's also because we're trying to solve that problem, all of that chaos, that complexity with manual work and scripts. And if there is a, a you know, people that say, oh, we need platform engineering, I say, okay, hold back, you know, what's the, what's the, can you explain the problem statement to me? And it's usually in the large amount of cases, yeah, developers wait and they're overwhelmed and cognitive load. And how do we deal with that? And our operation team handle repetitive, handles repetitive tasks and they're constantly, you know, debugging that deployment here and providing that new S3 bucket. And then somebody joins who wasn't here before and took over from somebody who just dropped things and left and then trying to make sense on how these things fit together. And, you know, they, they just wanted an S3 bucket, but then they spent two days on it. You know, these things happen because there is a wild complexity um, and there is um, a lot of things all over the place. And really the idea of platforming, the idea of platforms, internal developer platforms and platform engineering uh, is that you take a step back and you build a golden path that enables or that actually aligns your tools and practices alongside a golden path. A, if you want digital assembly line that lowers cognitive load for your developers and repetitive tasks for your platform and SRE teams and that drives standardization by design. Now, if you say sentences like um, a digital assembly line, a then people usually get nervous because they don't want to be treated as factory workers and they're right. But I mean digital factory line in the meaning of a Netflix, uh, where like a paved path that they can take with certain guarantees. They can deviate from that path, um, but um, on, uh, on, um, they don't, uh, they, they, they usually don't have to. Um, and that is very um, important. So uh, there are two beneficiaries of platforming, the application developers, again, self-service, reduced cognitive load, but very important without abstracting them away. We do not want to take context. We, don't, we do not want to take flexibility. And then for the platform and SRE team, they want to drive standardization by design, reduce ticket ops, and very important, they want to focus. Your operations teams should focus on hitting their SLAs, focus on hitting their OKRs. They shouldn't focus on repetitive tasks. I think, um, I mean, we should be beyond that uh, in, in most cases in 2022. All right, um, I'm always using that analogy. Um, immature organizations tell teams to build a car. We're in, a, in the ca car factory world because I'm from Germany and all we could do is build cars that are then outperformed by cars from America. Um, then you give them a credit card and tell them where to find a store with raw materials. When they struggle, these teams, they send people to help them organize and then they call this DevOps. The no next level of evaluation, of um, evolution. That's the mature organizations. They tell teams to build a car, they give them a credit card, then they tell them where to find raw materials, 
And if those teams struggle, then DevOps helps them to organize and cloud operation teams maybe help them to find the right materials and then prep those for them. And the final evolution is um, advanced organizations. Well, they tell the teams to build the car and the platform team prepares a platform and then the developers build on top. The My, my colleagues and, um, and, and I are um, primarily coming out of the Google world. And uh, if you look at Google, they have a very strong platform mindset. And um, contrary to common belief, in high performant engineering organizations, the level of um, touch points of the individual contributor with the stack is actually pretty low. At Google, you specify relationships between systems, architectures, everything, and then you send that um, off and the actual databases, where it runs, the load balances, those are handled by other teams. The, the, that is odd because you would believe, hmm, Google, amazing engineers, they can afford everything, everybody should be able to do everything. No, that's not the case. Uh, and what I'm observing is that uh, a lot of teams feel very uncomfortable doing that, you know, being removed away from uh, other parts of the stack. So one of the key questions in platform engineering is always how you set the abstractions. And one of the things that I find so fascinating is to answer why is it, how is it possible that teams like Google and GitHub and Airbnb, they work at a much higher level of abstraction. And my understanding is, and that is one of the key insights also here, is that they trust what happens behind this. And I looked, at, spent a little more time on this. Why do they trust? And the, the trust comes from several things. Uh, number one, they get um, context. Let me um, change my settings quickly. Sorry about that that okay now um the one of the key insights is that they trust uh, what happens if they do a certain request so if they say hey i need an s3 bucket for this they um first of all trust the the, the team that actually executes this but much more importantly um they are actually they get the context of what happens it's not a black box uh, google is very good at surfacing what this request actually does. One of my key learnings here is you can abstract, right? Un but you can never take context. That is, I think, one of the golden um, rules in, in, in platforming. All right, then I wanna quickly touch on what is an internal developer platform. And there is no one-on-one -on -one definition because if there would be a one-on-one -on -one definition, how an internal developer platform looks in your situation, in your respective team, as a bank or as an e-commerce startup or um, as a healthcare company in India, um, if there would be such a clear definition, you know, then it wouldn't be a, a subject to platform engineering. Platform engineering means you take the systems that you have right now and you craft them into a golden path. And that's a little unsatisfying. There are many people that are trying to really nail that down and give you the one definition. There is not the one definition. Um, and if there would be the one definition, you would have a platform as a service. In that case, I would encourage your company to simply use Heroku. But um, there are a, um, a there is a certain convergence in how these architectural designs of these platforms is actually done. Um, and um, I want to spend more time on this in the next months to um, publish more of those reference implementations. This year is one that I'm seeing a lot. Um, we call that a dynamic internal developer platform. You have your IDE, you have your version control, you have your CI pipeline. I think there is always important that CI pipelines, you usually or often have many different ones or several different ones. You have Jenkins and then you have GitLab and one division is using GitHub Actions. And my philosophy, and we're going to touch that also, is don't fight too much. Uh, don't waste too much time consolidating. Only consolidate if there is a clear ROI. Otherwise, build a point of connection of weaving those pipelines into a consistent flow. We're seeing um, a uh, large number of teams now building and using platform orchestrators. 
that basically take the pipelines in a so-called declarative application model and orchestrate the workloads, resources, um, and providers. And then there are many different interfaces into platforms. There's also not this one interface. Uh, many people say, oh, we're now building this cool U UI layer on top of um, all our tools. And now we have an internal developer platform. And that's not true, right? Um, if you build a um, shiny UI and a beautiful door, but behind the door, there's a horrible um, house and everything is all over the place and you don't have a golden path and you don't have a platform, you're just visualizing, um, you know, something that's uh, broken maybe. Um, but there are several different interfaces. Some are API-based, many are GitOps-based, UI-based, CLI-based, many use service catalogs or portals. And a uh, famous one here would be Lean IX, ServiceNow, uh, Snow by ServiceNow, or maybe um, Backstage. Those are often JavaScript layers that, you know, again, aggregate and visualize what you're using already. And then obviously your observability suite. Now, um, that is what internal developer platforms are. And now I want to touch where to actually get started. You have that random guy from Germany um, saying platform engineering is a good idea. And that's all good and fine and charming. But how do you now actually approach this? How do you uh, position this in front of your management? Why should you do this? You know, platforming is always um, like pair programming or refactoring. Try to explain that to your management who has limited ideas of what's going on in the engineering team anyways. That will probably not be super simple. So where do you get started? The first thing is that um, I, I recommend you is take baby steps, but take them very serious. Do not assume that you can just do this big bang and structure something and then throw this at them and huge amount of investment. And you can only do that if you have five full-time equivalents or 46 like GitHub. Um, that will not happen. And if it happens, your likelihood of failure is very large and you should, uh, and it's, um, in, you know, especially in a global recession and a global crisis that is hovering above us, uh, likely not a good idea. I recommend to go all in or nothing, do it very proper, but do it in baby steps and treat your platform as a product. Many people have said that before, Manuel Pais, uh, Gregor Hope um, from Amazon and uh, Team Topologies have preached this for years. I wanna double down on this. You have to treat those things as a product. And I encourage you to assign a product owner. And that can be only half time as a side project for the beginning, no problem. But there should be a PO with a roadmap in Jira or your favorite tool. Um, you need to have software engineers. And again, they can do it on the side or you can start in a hackathon, but those have to be real people that can code and build stuff. And then you have to conduct user interviews. And that means you have to identify your users and you have to talk to them and you have to ask them. Um, those users are usually the developers um, and it is um, important that you um, even ask them in a specific way. You need to get a representative subset um, of the things that um, really matter to them. The next thing is, and that is tied to the previous point, you need to prioritize what you are working on and you need to be brutal in your prioritization. And that's something that for whatever reason, I don't see people doing in a disciplined way. Lots of teams are just starting to, you know, raise some budgets and then, you know, start with platform engineering endeavors and just go ahead and create, start creating things and um, look at things that um, are obvious or feel obvious to do. And that's like always when you build products, when you start um, building assumptions, what functionality, what features you build just from the, from your 
individual position, then you're setting yourself up for failure. It is very unlikely that no matter how large your engineering team, you as a single individual can assess or understand what the problems on the ground are, even if you've been there and you've been one of the core contributors. The relative situation a junior front-end engineer finds herself in differs vastly from the experience of a, a principal Go engineer. And you need to get all of, uh, all of the um, perspectives. I'm always proposing the same um, uh, yeah, the, the good question from Ingo. When you say users, are these developers, architects, product owners, SREs for the service consuming the platform, all of them, which roles are key? Mm -hmm. Good question. So for me, it's um, number one, the developers. Those are the people that you serve. As platform engineers, we serve. And um, they are the one that are going to, you know, they're going to have to use the shit we're fabricating. Um, and those have to be, you know, we have to look at their daily interaction, number one. Number two are the SREs and operations teams. And they have repetitive things coming to them. A good sign that somebody needs a platform engineering team is if you look through your Jira lanes or Serv service now tickets or whatever you're using, or like uh, uh, um, with repetitive requests. Hey, I need a new environment. Hey, I need a new uh, S3 bucket. Hey, can you help me debug this deployment? So I would say if I speak about users, a user is a developer, but we also need to make sure that the um, people that suffer from that as well, the operations teams are heard. But what I'm observing usually is that the operations team are closer to the pulse of the platform engineering team anyways, because that is usually coming out of that group. So what I'm, um, what I'm then encouraging you to do is that you take a blank piece of paper and you ask yourself, well, what are the procedures on a daily basis that we actually need a platform for? And a good, um, a good uh, exercise uh, is to start asking yourself, when do we not need a platform? And the answer is pretty simple. In the so-called static case, the Git push update case, you know, when all the developer is doing is updating a service into something that's already there, then you don't need a platform because those things are very well captured in so-called static pipelines. You know, you have your CI, CD pipelines and maybe we could optimize the sign-off flows more and automated tests and inter-environment progression and, you know, grant it. But those are the things that are usually more or less stable. When you really need a platform is when you go beyond the simple update of an image. And that could be everything that um, goes along the lines of changing the relationship of workloads to each other in distributed architectures, refactoring, adding new infrastructure components, rolling back, adding a microservice, scaffolding a new service, spinning up an environment, all of these things. What I propose you do and what I've seen work well, you take that blank piece of paper, you write down the things that go beyond the simple update of an image just a long list. And then you um, select a set of colleagues. Again, they have to be representative. I propose not to ask them all at once. That is a mistake that I've seen that I'm seeing a lot that you have that hackathon, everybody's in the room anyways. And so you ask, hey, how do you want to interact with your delivery setup? The only voice you will hear now is the voice of the kernel hacker that has seen it all, that has no problem with complex bash scripts and that, you know, um, you know, is um, for whom it's very, it has no problem with anything, is very senior, everything is fine. The, 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 the position of that person doesn't reflect the position of the group. So ask individuals about what are the things that they do that go beyond the simple update of an image, 
then ask them, how often do you do that against 100 deployments? And then you ask them, how much time is included by developers per individual action? Then you go to the ops team, you ask them again, how much time do you spend per individual action on that particular task? And then you have that long list and you multiply this long list with the uh, total number of deployments. And then you actually have a very clear number of hours that your organization loses on these different things. And you take that and you use that as prioritization. Now, um, yeah, that is, the, that is the first exercise. And the byproduct of that is that you also have your return on investment case right there. The next time your managers ask you, hmm, do we really need this? Does it really make sense for you to allocate time on that? You can say then, hey, those are, this is the hard data. This is how much time we're spending on this. There's actually a report that we can send as well on industry average numbers for these things. So you can benchmark yourself against those as well. But that is a very clear case because the amount of hours that you're losing times the average salary uh, for that hour, you know, that's the loss for the business. That will make it crystal clear uh, why the organization should invest. In 95% of cases, it is a very clear case. All right, the next one. Agree on a lowest common denominator um, tech stack. And then next, uh, identify your future evangelists. What do I mean um, by that? We could take different routes now. We have the data, we look at the data and say, oh, you know, this looks amazing. Let's build this huge system that can do everything that can serve um, us here and that looks great. And then once we have this, we will roll this out to everybody and they will love that. That, as almost always in software engineering, is probably not going to cut it. The chances that your highly opinionated users in the end, they're like all of us software engineers, uh, will say, oh, great, somebody throws another tool at me. That is very, very unlikely. In fact, the most common debt, I mean, the, the most common reasons for platform engineering teams to fail is lack of adoption with the developers. It's your worst case. It's very bad because the first time you actually realize that is when you've already wasted 12 months. So I encourage you not to do that. Um, I call it the push-based approach. Build something shiny, push it onto the user. N not really battle-tested to work. I am always proposing to focus on a subset and focus on a um, small subset of, uh, of uh, technologies that you want to support. I call it the lowest common denominator tech stack. Um, and that would be, what do you think that in the future, <coughs> the future being three months, um, can the uh, organization reasonably run on? And, you know, your first instinct will tell you Lambda, maybe, but the tooling isn't there. It's not growing that fast. It's maybe aspirational. It should be something that, you know, the industry is already there and is, you know, the dominant mainstream. In the vast amount of cases, it is something around containers and EKS or, you know, any other flavor. Um, and I would take that, focus on that stack, and then really work against that stack. Now, the next thing you do is that you identify one team or depending on the size of your organization, a number of small number of representative teams, and those are your future evangelists. And um, the this team is a team of innovators. There are always these teams around you. I'm sure you can think of one that are faster in adopting staff. They're more open. They are. They actually welcome this as something that's good for their careers and interesting. And um, the this team has to have an application that is exactly on your new targets tech stack or can move there. 
So don't use a team that's running, you know, like old legacy monoliths. You want to have a team that is representative of the future. And make sure that this team really wants to do it. They're open to do that. They're excited about that. They will be your allies. And your job is, your only job is to make a something, build something with them that makes a material difference for them and that they are excited about. They need to be proud and you need to give them the feeling that you built this together. You're in this together. You are the ones in the organization that is actually pushing forward the next frontier. Um, it's so exciting. And you need to uh, let them be the heroes and actually create the pull afterwards. So other than the push, where we're pushing this onto them, you are actually taking a subgroup, you are making them the real heroes, and you then let them pull. That is much, much more powerful, much more, uh, much faster, and um, has proven to work much um, better. The next thing is an architectural choice. Um, and that has something to do with configuration management. Um, and that is something that we did quite heavily um, at, um, at, at Google as well. We use an approach called dynamic configuration management. That is the idea of actually layering abstractions. What we mean by that is that you um, pull apart the environment agnostic from the environment specific elements of configuration into what's referred to as a declarative application model. And that model usually has five components. And the lower you go into the component stack, um, the closer you move to the infrastructure, if you want. So you have your workloads on the upper level, and then you move down into environment agnostic configuration elements and the individual user defines whether they want to stay on that abstraction level or if you allow that in role-based access control to go down the stack and actually go into the nitty gritties. And what we observe is that the vast majority of teams actually stay up here. Uh, there's actually a new um, open source project that's going to be donated to uh, the CNCF called the Platform Agnostic Workload Specification. Actually, this is a working title. The name will be SCORE. And now you can see uh, hear my little son screaming in the background. That's awesome. Um, and that's actually an abstract description of uh, the relationship of workloads in uh, connection to other workloads and dependent resources. And it's the basically highest level of opaque abstraction. Um, and it's the second position in the general declarative application model. Um, and then you have something like the platform orchestrator to, um, interpreting this model here on the infra profile level. Those would be uh, Terraform or Crossplane or Pulumi, your infrastructure as code. And the platform orchestrator reads those um, in combination with CI who builds those and then actually generates a representation just in time with the deployment. That is, I usually recommend that. That is very, very, very beneficial um, and um, helps you to help these people um, uh, define the or find the right level of abstraction for their individual um, preference. Now, um, the other approach that we could take here is the so called static approach, and that's the usual approach that you are seeing in the industry. And that um, would be um, basically taking uh, static scripts, YAML files per environment, Terraform files, stuffing them into, uh, into repositories, and then having humans write these files and then actually use a CD controller to, um, to uh, execute those. Um, that doesn't mean, you know, in the dynamic world, still everything Git-based. But again, you have that application model and the representation of the app is created just in time with the deployment. So again, step four, figure out whether you want to use dynamic or static. Now then, um, step five, you are starting to build. And now give me 10 seconds so I can quickly tell my children not to knock on my door.
All right, back. So uh, the next step is to start building. And that, and now it's important to build something that is significantly better than what the team had before. Again, start small. Don't do too much. Figure out where the ROI is and then solve that specific problem for them. Work in small increments. Uh, spend too much time on this. I really encourage you to plan time in the roadmap where people would say, well, we could do so much more here. Doesn't matter. Do this one thing. Do it properly. Focus on only this thing and make sure you please your early users. They need to become fans. The evangelism team, they need to love it in order for them to build on and actually uh, scale that out and create that um, push factor. Right. Now, the next one, um, make sure to understand and just um, prepare yourself that this is a very long journey. Platform engineering, by definition, doesn't stop. Iteration, 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 iteration. You need to constantly um, reassess, reevaluate, understand how these pieces fit together. There is a large community of practitioners now. Um, there is a lot of data there. People can help you. There are great Slack channels in the platform Slack, only for product owners, for platforms, uh, only for builders. Um, make sure you do. Um, you actually, um, you know, gather. Uh, things and ideas there. And with that, thank you very much for the time uh, that you listened to me. I hope this was helpful and I would be glad to take more questions. Thank you so much, Kasper. It was amazing. And we had uh, so many people joining in and listening. It was so insightful. Uh, there were a few questions. Well, uh, you were talking about uh, industry standard report. People are asking who is helping to build these procedures on the list um, and where, where, where the data basically and procedures come from. Um, who the benchmarking and the procedures are. Okay, yeah. yeah. So <clears throat> this is basically a, you know, group of Mm, open source enthusiasts, uh, really, a group that you can join um, that um, uh, th that you can be part of. Um, I just want to emphasize this again. We always look for people to join forces with us. And you will see that, you know, unless you're trying to advertise weapons here, um, we are going to be very open and forthcoming and having you speak in one of these events, having you be part of the evaluation. That particular evaluation um, that, I'm, uh, that I'm referencing uh, was done by, um, by a combination of different um, parties. And um, it's the same thing like the Puppet State of DevOps report um, that we're now actually cooperating with. Um, and I think those were Puppet, Circle CI, um, and a couple of individuals. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Ricardo is asking to put back last slide uh, really quickly. I'm not sure if he has a question around that, but uh, Ricardo will also be sending out, um, I guess, the slide before that. Yeah. We'll, uh, we'll also be sending out um, slides with uh, at the follow-up with the webinar replay and a couple of useful links um, just let us know what you were particularly interested in. Then there is a question from Louise, uh, who is saying, uh, most of the points sound really something even useful at the time that you are considering just migration rather than the preparation of a platform for the developers. I guess that's just a comment. I don't see any questions, uh, any question in this, um, Say, but we have a bunch of those in the Q and A section. Um, if you want to learn more about dynamic uh, IDP, where would you go next? Yeah, that is a good question. I don't think we have enough. Uh, there is enough content on this out there. Um, <clears throat> maybe Maria, you can have a look what we what we recommend in that case. The tooling section of 
uh, internaldeveloperplatform.org has just been cleaned up and relaunched. Um, and that feels like a good space. Uh, other than that, Maria, I'm sure you can send over uh, things to for Trenton to consume. Yeah, will do. Uh, then there is a question from Andy, uh, who's asking either any standard IDP that works for most or many, or uh, are they all completely unique in your experience? Yeah, that's a great question. No, they're they're less unique than you think. So I've been speaking with a couple of people last week, and we believe that there are around seven stereotype or most used platforms. And unfortunately for you, we've not been able to find the time to actually, um, you know, um, document those yet. Um, but that is something that I want to work on right now. Um, it is more or less, yeah, I, it's the architecture is more or less looking like the one that you're seeing right here. That is the, the most um, common case. But I'm we're going to send you, uh, I mean, if you have specific questions, send me an email, but we're going to make sure that we're actually giving that reference implementations. And my vision, if you want, is to, um, Package platforms as code. Um, I call it platform as code, very original. And uh, that my, my dream scenario would be we can package that as code and you can take that and run that in an, in an I don't know, Amazon AWS account. And then you have a prepackaged one, um, but uh, we're not there yet. Cool. Thank you. Then uh, another one from Luis regarding the declarative application model, is there an overlap with the open application model? Is there an overlap with the open application model? Uh, to a certain degree. So um, my problem with the open application model, and I hope I don't offend anyone, is that it's tied to a specific implementation and provider. Um, and I'm not sure it's a good idea to have an industry-wide specification tied to a company that wants to monetize that, which is why the, um, this new specification, which is also you know, different, it's on a different abstraction layer, um, is set up in a way where it's completely provider agnostic and every provider can build implementations against that. Um, and which is also why it's completely do donated to CNCF. So there are some overlaps. I've observed the OAM with interest. I've not seen it take off that much. Oh, and, and Andy, that is something you should definitely do. You should reach out to me and we should talk about platform as code. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, then there, uh, there were some questions in the main chat, so I'll jump in uh, there for a second and then we'll go back. Uh, so the question is uh, procedures lists. Uh, what's the best way to generate this based on context and users? I guess, again, the question re referring to the procedures list you were talking in earlier. Based on context and users. Yeah, so um, come up with I mean, I would focus with the developers on the developers first, because again, if you don't get adoption in the developer phase, your your operations people can love a product and it will still completely fail. So um, um, categorize your developers in junior and senior and across the different functions. So if you have, let's say, most common QA, front and back end, take those three and you then bucket into junior, senior, and you ask all of those individually. And then you take the average of those numbers in relation to like weighted by the number of total um, contributors in relationship to the um, total team size. And um, from there, you build the list. Got it. Uh, the next question is again from Ricardo. He's saying that uh, they're a very small startup where processes are not clear uh, overall. How um, how to make a case for a platform more efficient, uh, more effectively without making it look like it is an overkill? 
So as a very small startup, in my experience, you should be using something like Heroku um, is my very honest answer, because in most cases, that meets your scalability demand best. It is not the job of, you know, the, the job is to make your small startup survive. You know, it's not the job to have an incredibly fancy delivery setup. Um, you can take something that's more off the shelf. The beauty, especially when you start, is that well-crafted platforms um, make it less likely to do architectural misdesigns. Uh, so especially if you have a distributed architecture, making sure you enforce parameterization, making sure you enforce the use of secrets, making sure you stay lean, um, that would be your case. Um, and, in, you know, it... I would always recommend you to build a platform and to build very strict golden paths, especially at a young age of your company. Um, but if possible, I would even more so encourage you to use a platform as a service. Yeah. Uh, when do you think is the right time for an organization to move to a software catalog like Backstage, et cetera? I think... Um, so I have a hard time commenting on, um, you know, specific tools. Um, I encourage you to look at your ROI calculation again. The, um, is your problem, like, what's the problem you're trying to solve here? Is your problem that you need to scaffold new services, you know? Or And if that's your problem, why can you not just use GitHub templates or GitLab templates? You know, they're awesome. You know, where's the, why do you need a fairly heavy UI solution? Is that maybe because you believe your developers will adopt that? More honestly unlikely, because I've not seen developers like UIs a lot. Um, is that because you're hoping to get more standardization than GitLab, GitHub templates? I've not seen that either because all that Backstage or any of these tools would be using is to send an API call to a GitHub template. Is that because you want to simplify developer onboarding and they want to have everything in one place? Yeah, you know, maybe, but if you actually look at the daily interaction and let's say one of the common reasons why you would do that, that I hear a lot is we want to make the template searchable, okay? We want to have everything in one place. Well, um, that not even that necessarily needs to be uh, the case. And and Rasmus, this has nothing to do with uh, the company I work for. Uh, we actually, you know, if you wanted to refer, refer to us, we work very well in tandem with Backstage. Backstage makes a tremendous amount of sense uh, in in lots of cases, but those need to be the right cases. You know, there is a Humane Tech plugin on the uh, on the catalog uh, on the on their catalog is a standard plugin. People are there are whole agencies that are focused on doing implementations with uh, Humane Tech as a backend and uh, backstage as a front end. So that's definitely not the reason. I'm just advocating for making sure that you um, get the right uh, horse for the right course to quickly get their services up and running without having to repeat themselves. Yeah, but again, like. If you look at the implementation detail below the JavaScript layer, um, it is just calling APIs, you know, and um, it makes sense at a certain scale, but that scale needs to be there. And if you say, okay, uh, quickly get their services up and running, well, how often do you actually need to get new services up and running? I have no idea how large the organization is that you uh, that you uh, that you work for, but it needs to have a very very sufficient scale, um, like, you know, hundreds of services a year. Yeah, uh, I guess uh, for the Rasmus and his question regarding the humanity tech offering the right way, would we just reach out to Casper or Casper, you want to answer? Um, no, we can answer more. I'm, I'm happy to I have my eight more minutes. 
Uh, yeah. Uh, then uh, there is one more uh, interesting question. Have you seen this uh, thinking executed in an agency setting where a really wide range of products is being built with small product teams, but the intent is still to attempt a level of standardization to allow de uh, developer teams to focus their effort on product specific work? Uh, yes. Funny enough, I'm seeing more and more agencies um, doing that, but that depends a little bit. It depends what type of agencies. You know, there are the agencies that build stuff themselves in re, in a repetitive motion and then hand that over to the to the to the users. Um, that's the one case. Um, and then there, you know, the out, um, you know staffing things that are positioned somewhere. And then it, maybe it doesn't make that much sense. But you know, I want to you know tell the story of a of an agency. I won't name the the name in the. EMEA Nordics, um, they're building many, mainly Drupal, Next.js combinations, running with, you know, a couple of databases, DNS, and they, I think they have a hundred or something. Um, and then some of them are even hosted for the, for the user. So there, it makes a lot of sense uh, because you have a pretty, um, pretty large, pretty, pretty large overhead. So if you can somehow again standardize on a tech denominator, then it works very well because you will have higher effects of scale. Um, yeah. yeah, I hope that helps. Yeah. Next question: What's the level of maturity of the different plat of different platforms? Uh, could someone migrate from one to other using well-defined standards in the future? Or most of the components uh, are custom modules. Well, I mean, most of the components are probably the components you have right now, um, honestly. But they're just um, optimized into golden paths. So, I I think. Uh, you can do a lot with the things that you have right now. And let's say you have you have a, a Jenkins setup right now. You know, Jenkins can be very complex, but maybe the best error I is just for you to simplify and streamline your Jenkins pipelines. Um, and then that would mean your past is your future. And uh, there is no there is no there is no clear uh, like distinct definition there is no you can't say you know my current platform as a service is heroku and the next one is render.com and i have a clear migration path um platform engineering is ever evolving it's a constantly changing um thing cool Yes, we have no questions. I'll just give you one more minute uh, to um, type in your questions if you have one. Uh, I know that there are many folks from platform engineering community and many of those will be attending Cubicon. So I wanted to share something. We'll be hosting a party for a uh, platform engineering community in Detroit, House of Cube, really cool one. So please RSVP if you wanna join in and if you're attending uh, Cubicon, uh, we'll have hot sauces tasting. So please come prepared. Uh, so many, many fun things planned. Um, well, I don't see any other questions coming in. I'll make sure we include um, the links and content uh, regarding dynamic uh, IDP. Um, oh, I see one more question come in. <laughs> uh, so um, I see a lot of customers moving their infrastructure to, uh, to the cloud. From your own experience, uh, what gives the best results moving to a cloud provider or build your own uh, platform as a service? So, um, you know, if you're building your own platform as a service, it needs to run somewhere. Um, and it will probably run on a cloud provider. Um, so, you know, I, my recommendation nowadays would be move to a cloud provider, but don't fall for the fallacy that you can just hand out Amazon accounts and uh, pray that people will not abuse them or be completely overwhelmed. Um, again, also, you're you're not building your own uh, you're not building your own pass. That's important. A pass is very restrictive. A pass shields people away from context. Um, I mean, try to figure out where something runs in Heroku. 
the engineers that you work with are grown-ups and they work at scale. They need to have more context than the past. So, you know, your question should be, the actual like precise question is, um, should you use, should you just move to a plain cloud provider and uh, pray? Or should you build a platform on top of a cloud provider to provide golden paths? And, you know, I mean, you probably um, guess what my answer would be is that I would uh, choose the platform path uh, track anytime. Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, so Casper will stay in platform engineering as uh, Slack today and tomorrow and like he's there all the time so you can easily uh, post the question for him or take him directly um, just find platform engineering Slack and I can post the link one more time other than that thank you so much guys for joining in uh, thank you for being so active with questions for listening in and uh, we'll follow up with the webinar replay and a few useful links uh, tomorrow and um, I don't know thank you so much for your time sign up for other webinars we have a bunch of those um, upcoming all right thank you so much for joining have a wonderful day bye